Hello, everybody. I am Anka Panaitescu, a former fellow of the Fetal Medicine Foundation. But currently, I'm working in my hometown in Bucharest, Romania. I'm very honored and happy to be presenting here again in this what I consider a very important regional meeting. So my talk today will be about placental, the placental growth factor, PLGF, and its added value to the first trimester screening. I will start off by emphasizing the importance of this first trimester visit, which usually takes place between 11 to 13 weeks. And it is a visit that allows us not only to assess the fetus, but also to estimate the risks for the mother for the pregnancy ahead. It, uh, it was because of the vision of our great professor Nicolaides that through his research in the last 30 years has managed to upturn the pyramid of pregnancy care, establishing this first trimester visit as a pillar for pregnancy care. So what do we do uh, within this visit? First, we assess viability, we assess the localization of the pregnancy, we do the dating, and actually this is the best time to do dating of pregnancy. We assess chorionicity in twin, twins' pregnancies, and we see a lot of twin pregnancies now because of the introduction of uh, IVF and assisted reproductive techniques, and it is the best time to see chorionicity at the first trimester visit. We traditionally have been doing screening for chromosomal abnormalities within this visit. We do the systematic fetal structural assessment. And recently, we have been adding screening for preeclampsia and other pregnancy complications within this, vis this visit with the aim to prevent. So what about screening for Down syndrome? This has been introduced back in the 1990s uh, by the Fetal Medicine Foundation uh, within a research that demonstrated uh, the efficiency of an algorithm uh, based on the maternal, uh, maternal characteristics like maternal age, um, markers from the ultrasound scan like the nuchal translucency, and markers in maternal blood like serum, beta ICG, and PAPE. And this combination of these markers had proved in the algorithm to be the best, um, to achieve the best detection rates. This is 90% detection rate with a false positive rate of 5% for Down syndrome. Sure, if we combine other biomarkers like uh, nasal bone and uh, tricuspid or ductus venosus flow, we can achieve even higher detection rates of 97%. What about adding a PLGF to this screening? So a, a study from the Fetal Medicine Foundation proved that in pregnancies with trisomy 21, uh, in comparison to PAPE, which uh, has a deviation from normal that decreases with increasing gestational age, PLGF uh, is more stable and its deviation from normal does not change with gestation. This is important to uh, keep in mind. Um, and also uh, what uh, the Fetal Medicine Foundation proved in relation to this study, to this uh, subject, is that um, PAPE has uh, higher detection rates at 11 and 12 weeks as compared to PLGF um, in, in the algorithm. However, at more than 13 weeks, PLGF is slightly superior to PAPE. Overall, um, the screening, for, PAP, the screening uh, for Downs by PAPE and PLGF is similar. And the addition of PLGF does not improve the prediction provided by the fetal nuchal translucency, free beta ICG, and PAPE in combination. We have seen it all in the last uh, years, the rise of the NIPT, the cell-free DNA testing in maternal blood for trisomy 21 and other more common trisomies like uh, trisomy 18 and 13, and now uh, the 
D for D George. Uh, these tests um, are very good in picking up trisomy 21. They are, have very good detection rates for false positive, for very small false positive rates. However, they are unlikely to be replacing the current strategies uh, for screening for Downs for chromosomal abnormalities in most countries worldwide because they are still very expensive. What about screening for preeclampsia? So, screening for preeclampsia is worthwhile because preeclampsia is a, uh, one of the most common medical conditions associated with pregnancy. And you can see here the data that we picked about the incidence of preeclampsia in Europe. You can see it does vary a lot from 0.6% in Russia to 4.6% in uh, Ireland. And of course, it depends on the characteristics of the population studied and on the definition used for preeclampsia. But uh, in our settings, for instance, when we, where we have published our data, our hospital being a tertiary maternity where we get a lot of referrals from outside Bucharest, uh, and this is a study before the introduction of aspirin, we had an incidence of preeclampsia of 1.2%, 2.2% of gestational hypertension, and 0.4% of chronic hypertension. Uh, talking about the definition, just to remind ourselves, the most uh, common definition used today is that proposed by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in 2013. Um, and this definition says that if you have hypertension with significant proteinuria in a pregnancy after 20 weeks, you have preeclampsia or if you don't have proteinuria, but you have hypertension and low platelets or high creatinine or high liver enzymes or pulmonary edema or other uh, symptoms, uh, you still get preeclampsia. So the definition is for preeclampsia. The only known treatment for preeclampsia so far is delivery. And this is an important problem for uh, those very severe cases of preeclampsia that develop uh, way before term, because the delivery leads to, the, uh, to, to getting a very preterm baby. You have seen these figures already. Preeclampsia is one of the top maternal killers worldwide. So every year, 50,000 maternal deaths are to preeclampsia. And you can see the distribution here. Um, the most affected countries are those in uh, developing and underdeveloped regions. But this condition, you have to keep in mind, as you will see in the next few slides, is a preventable condition. So one in six maternal deaths are due to preeclampsia, and preeclampsia only comes second after hemorrhage as a cause of direct maternal death in, um, in many countries worldwide. The same is seen in our country, in Romania. One in six maternal deaths are because of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and preeclampsia. So who is screened for preeclampsia? Well, traditionally, screening was based on a risk factor assessment, and this was proposed by the NICE guidelines in 2010 and was endorsed by the WHO in 2011. And uh, it was like that. If you have uh, one of the high risk factors, so previous preeclampsia, chronic kidney disease, chronic hypertension, diabetes, or lupus, or antiphospholipid syndrome, or if you have two of the moderate risk factors, a first pregnancy, age more than 40, body mass index more than 35, a high inter, uh, interpregnancy interval, or a family history of preeclampsia, you would indeed receive aspirin for prophylaxis. However, what we have seen recently, the data from the Fetal Medicine uh, Foundation that uh, used the same mental approach that they had when developing a, uh, an algorithm for screening for chromosomal abnormalities uh, in developing a prediction model for preeclampsia. So they looked at the a, a priori risk, like maternal characteristics, medical and obstetrical history, 
for the mother. They added me uh, measurable biomarkers like PLGF expressed as multiple of medians to modify the prior risk and to estimate a posterior risk. And in their research, they looked for many combinations that would predict best preeclampsia and what uh, indeed was the best way to, um, to approach this, this prediction was by combining maternal risk factors like age, weight, racial origin, obstetric history, like being in a first pregnancy or previous pregnancy affected by preeclampsia, family history of preeclampsia, conception by IVF, chronic hypertension, diabetes, or or autoimmune disease with the measurement of maternal mean arterial pressure and the ultrasound measurement of the uterine artery pulsatility index and maternal serum PLGF. And uh, combining all these factors in an algorithm that the Fetal Medicine Foundation proposed would lead to a uh, detection rate of 90% of all cases of uh, preeclampsia developing um, before 34 weeks and 75% detection rate for preeclampsia developing before term. You can see here the uh, bits of the algorithm. You can find all of this free of charge online on the Fetal Medicine Foundation page and you can introduce your data to get uh, to estimate the risk for the pregnancy. It's important to keep in mind that when measuring all these factors that we need for the, the algorithm, we have to be very rigorous in, in the way we measure things. So for the mean arterial pressure, for instance, we should be using automated calibrated devices. We should be using an appropriate cuff when we measure and to take two measurements for both arms. Also, there are uh, criteria that we should meet when measuring your uterine artery Doppler pulsatility index. You can find this data on the website of the Fetal Medicine Foundation. And it's important to be rigorous about this measurement because indeed it does influence the detection rates that we can have. For the PLGF, I would just like to emphasize that this can be measured in the same blood that we uh, draw, that we take for uh, beta-ECG and PAP-A when we do this for uh, screening for Downs. So we measure PLGF from the maternal serum between um, at the time uh, when we do the uh, PAP-A and beta-ECG. Um, well, the next step for the Fetal Medicine Foundation after proposing this algorithm was to validate it and this was the aim of the SPRI study, a study that took place in seven NHS hospitals in England for the routine screening at the 11 to 13 weeks and the, uh, within the study the FMF compared the, um, the performance uh, of screening by the uh, NICE guidelines, the NICE risk factors based approach, which you can see here in blue, to the Fetal Medicine Foundation approach by combining history, MAP, uterine artery pulsatility index and PLGF, which is depicted here in red. And you can see that uh, the FMF approach got the best uh, the superior uh, detection rates, so 90% for preeclampsia developing before 34 weeks as compared to 47% and 82% for preterm preeclampsia compared to 41%. And uh, the FMF published its data in terms of detection rates um, based on some of the biomarkers or combination of biomarkers. And the best way to predict, to detect, to increase your detection rate is by combining PLGF with uh, other uh, markers. And you can see here that whenever we would add PLGF to uh, each of the biomarkers alone on, or in combination, we do get higher detection rates. So, for instance, if you take the history of the mother and you add PAPE, you have a detection rate of 48%. 
um, for a 10% uh, percent screen positive rate. But if you use history with PLGF, the detection rate goes to 60%. And when you compare this uh, approach uh, with uh, all the biomarkers that we can achieve is history, uh, MAP, UTPI, uh, PAPE versus PLGF. Detection rate with PAPE is 67% versus 74%. And if we uh, add PLGF and PAPE together, we do not get superior rates of preeclampsia, preterm preeclampsia detection uh, as compared to using just PLGF alone. This was be, uh, demonstrated again uh, in the screening quality uh, study that the, um, the Fetal Medicine Foundation undertook. Best detection rates are uh, achieved when using PLGF, and PLGF is indeed superior in selecting cases that will develop preeclampsia than PAPE. So uh, we, as you have seen, we would now have a very good algorithm to detect preeclampsia and the Fetal Medicine Foundation went on to in search of the way to prevent preeclampsia and to help these women that would indeed uh, get to develop preeclampsia and uh, this was the aim of the ASPRE trial. You have heard about it and Professor Nicolaides will talk about it. What I just want to add for this presentation is that the basis of this, the trial was a screening population of uh, almost 27,000 women, pregnant women, at 11 to 13 weeks, which in several European countries uh, were um, subjected to the algorithm of uh, screening for preeclampsia proposed by the Fetal Medicine Foundation. And those that got to be classified as high risk um, was 11% of the population, were randomized to receive aspirin or placebo. The dose of aspirin, you know it, is 150 milligrams per day, starting at 12 weeks with the finish line at 36 weeks for uh, every day at bedtime. And with this approach, there, there was an impressive reduction in cases of preeclampsia, especially in cases of early severe preeclampsia that cases develop, those cases developing before 32 weeks where we had a very high chance of preterm delivery with a very small baby that would require a lot of uh, NICU support. So to conclude my presentation, you, you have seen PLGF as a very useful marker. Uh, in the first trimester visit, we currently do screening for chromosomal abnormalities, and this is based on the first trimester combined uh, test. Uh, this test is, has a widespread use, and this supported uh, currently by uh, most of the guidelines. It is unlikely to be replaced in the near future by NIPT because of the uh, high costs of NIPT and the good performance of the uh, first trimester combined test. And on this basis, on the back of this first trimester combined tests, we can now add screening for preeclampsia and other pregnancy complications like fetal growth restriction with the aim of preventing the, them. And this can be easily uh, done by adding to the first trimester screening algorithm, maternal and obstetrical characteristics, the measurement of mean arterial uh, pressure in the mother, the, measure, the ultrasound measurement of the uterine artery pulsatility index, and the measurement of PLGF at the, from this maternal serum that we do indeed measure PAPE and beta-ECG from. Thank you very much.